Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, yeah, so today I'm really pleased to have Miles Allen here uh, with us uh, from across the Atlantic. So uh, I met Miles, I think first, uh, well, nearly 30 years ago now, uh, when we were both at MIT at that time. So, uh, but then Miles uh, moved back to the UK and I don't think we've We've seen each other after he moved that back to you, uh, to to the UK. Uh, so uh, Miles is currently a professor of geosystem science at Oxford University. Uh, he has made a lot of contributions on uh, related climate change issues. Uh, he served on the IPCC. Uh, he was lead author uh, to a chapter in the third assessment report, and more recently. Uh, he was the coordinating lead author on the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, he also founded the Climate Prediction .net project that used distributed computing to run the world's largest ensemble climate modeling experiments. I think a lot of people participated in that, download a climate model and then run on your PC. Uh, in 2010, he was awarded the Appleton Medal and Prize for, from the United Kingdom Institute of Physics for his important contributions to the detection and attribution of human influence on climate and quantifying uncertainty in climate predictions. And more recently, in 2020, he was featured on the BBC's Life Scientific as the physicist behind Net Zero, which I, I guess we'll hear about uh, in this talk. So without further ado, uh, I'll pass the, uh, the talk to Miles. So welcome, Miles. Thank you very much, Edmund. And uh, it's slightly depressing to think that the Earth was about half a degree cooler when we last met. We can start to measure our careers in tenths of a degree now. But hopefully we can turn this around in the next 30 years. That's really what this talk is all about, um, achieving net zero. Um, it's the goal that's been set by more and more governments around the world. Um, your own administration is talking about setting a net zero 2050 goal. China has set a carbon neutrality by 2060 goal. Um, most European countries have signed up to some form of climate neutrality by mid-century. This talks about what all this means and how on earth we're going to do it. Um, and uh, I'll sort of, it's pretty about half and half what it means uh, and how we're going to do it. Um, so the first, uh, so sort of the first, you know, thing we have to ask ourselves. Um, so if I just point out when I last met Edmund, somewhere around here, I guess. Um, so, you know, we're warming um, at uh, 0.2 degrees per decade. Um, more than 0.2 degrees per decade and global warming, human influence, human induced global warming has passed 1.1 degrees already. So it won't be long before we reach 1.5 degrees. These are the big drivers illustrated here. You can see the blue line there showing the responses to explosive volcanoes and solar variability and the uh, orange line illustrating the response to greenhouse gases and aerosols, the net impact of human influence on climate. So if we just retain that orange line and ask ourselves what's driving it, because we need to understand what's driving it in order to understand how we're gonna stop it. And this graph, also from the website, by the way, globalwarmingindex.org, if you want to follow up on these numbers, you can download the spreadsheet from there and find out how we get these numbers. This graph shows you the orange line, which is net human induced anthropogenic warming. And the gray, the dark gray wedge is just cumulative carbon dioxide emissions added up over time in trillions of tons of carbon dioxide. And the light gray wedge is other drivers of climate change human-induced drivers of climate change expressed in watts per square meter. So this, and you'll notice that you add these two things together, you pretty much reproduce the orange line. Um, there's a small discrepancy around the 1970s, which is possibly due to 
errors in the carbon dioxide data, by the way, not, not uh, anything to do with the relationship I'm showing you here. So warming is a very simple sum of total carbon dioxide emissions, capital G, and other forcings, delta F, divided by alpha, which is just a coefficient, and it's roughly one watt per square meter per trillion tons of carbon dioxide to convert the one to the other. So this all looks very simple. Um, and it's that sort of information that was used to reach the conclusion in the IPCC's special report on 1.5 degrees that reaching and sustaining net zero global anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions and declining net non-CO2 radiative forcing would halt anthropogenic global warming on multi-decadal timescales. Now, just, just to clarify for the students here, in IPCC jargon, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, net non-CO2 radiative forcing means the net impact on the global energy imbalance of all these other drivers of CO2 that are affected by other drivers other than CO2 that are affected by human activity, including things like methane emissions, aerosols and soot and nitrous oxide. So we're saying that CO2 emissions have to get to net zero and we have to get the net impact of these other drivers onto a decline and that that would halt anthropogenic global warming. The word halt was very carefully chosen here and I'll come back to why it says halt in a few minutes. Um, the IPCC report went on to say the maximum temperature reach is then determined by cumulative net global anthropogenic CO2 emissions up to that time, up to the time that you reach net zero and the level of non-CO2 radiative forcing in the decades immediately prior to that time. Okay, so that's what the IPCC says is going to determine the peak temperature we reach. So that's a lot of words. Let's think about what it means and why we claim this is true. By the way, I, I won't do it now, but I strongly encourage you to go and have a look at an interactive demonstration of what controls peak warming uh, if you follow that link or you can follow this link uh, through the, uh, the PowerPoint, which I'll, I'll give to uh, Edmund afterwards uh, so you can, you can see. So you can actually play around with the data net zero and the level of non-CO2 radiative forcing and see what impact has, it has on the global temperatures reached. So now we're going to unpack this statement and help us to understand why the IPCC was able to draw that conclusion. Human-induced warming um, over you know, at the sort of time scales we're interested in, which is sort of a few years to a few decades, really, maybe a, up to a century or two, is proportional to that total cumulative carbon dioxide emissions, this big G, that's the total number of tons of carbon dioxide we dump into the atmosphere, plus a contribution from the change in energy imbalance due to other drivers, that's delta F, plus a small adjustment to the average level of forcing due to other drivers of climate change. Just those three terms turn out to be enough to explain how human drivers of climate change group together to give us human-induced warming. And the coefficients in this uh, equation are actually things which are now increasingly familiar to people. Kappa, which is this big constant which determines the overall scaling is what we call the transient climate response to emissions or the number of degrees of warming you get per trillion tons of carbon dioxide you dump in the atmosphere. And it's about 0.4 to 0.5 degrees per trillion tons. In fact, the IPCC in the fifth assessment report gave a range from 0.23 to 0.68 degrees per trillion tons. These are degrees Celsius, of course. Um, and they've, they've narrowed that range down slightly in the latest assessment, but broadly speaking, it's about the same. Alpha is what you might call the transient forcing response to emissions or the amount by which the atmospheric energy budget is disturbed by the release of a trillion tons of carbon dioxide. And it's around one watt per square meter per trillion tons of carbon dioxide. And rho, the only other coefficient you need to know is the rate at which the energy imbalance due to carbon dioxide would decline under zero emissions. So let's just look at this again. If we imagine this goes to zero, then delta F, 
would decline. And we'll see how that happens in a minute. So there you are, this is the rate. This, this is what needs to get to net zero to stop global warming. Because if we make everything inside the brackets here zero, then delta T, the, the human induced warming over a time interval, like a few decades in the second half of the century, would be zero. So human induced warming would stop. Um, so first of all, let's see how this works. How do we reach this conclusion? Well, let, the red line here is a simulation from uh, the, the, the kind of uh, a stylized model of the climate response to emissions that the IPCC uses to calculate things like global warming potentials and so on. It's based on the uh, results of much more complex Earth system models putting all these things together. And this is the response to a constant carbon dioxide emissions, which starts in near zero and continues for 200 years. And in the vertical here, it's the impact that those carbon dioxide emissions have on the planetary energy budget, on the balance of energy, incoming energy from the sun and outgoing energy to space. And we're measuring that in watts per square meter and we're assuming this is a 1 billion ton per year rate of emission. So you can see this is the impact of that in terms of watts per square meter going up. Um, it's slight, almost a straight line, but slightly curved. And so there's, there's a fairly, co fairly complex model behind this, well, lots of very complicated models behind this, all synthesized down into this synthesis model that the IPCC uses to sum up the impact of carbon dioxide on climate. And there's multiple time constants involved in that. But it turns out we can actually reproduce the behavior of all of these much more complicated models with this very, very simple equation. Um, emissions of carbon dioxide are just the rate of change of forcing plus a small term due to the forcing itself. And if you solve that expression, you end up with these blue lines where um, F is the carbon dioxide induced forcing and alpha um, is about one. Uh, the AGWP I'm talking about here is again a, a familiar um, uh, constant to people who work in climate policy. It's called the absolute global warming potential of carbon dioxide. And it's the integrated impact of one ton of carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere uh, over the next hundred years on the planetary energy budget. That's sort of what, how, how uh, climate policy, climate policy wonks like to compare greenhouse gases. So that's the absolute global warming potential of carbon dioxide over hundred years. And that divided by a hundred, divided by the hundred years and um, divided by this um, sort of small, co this, this coefficient gamma, which is sort of roughly one, a little bit less than one, um, is um, of order one. So that's one watt per square meter per trillion tons of CO2. So um, if that's the, um, if that's the uh, emission, if that's the relationship between um, emissions and forcing, we can just modify that equation by integrating it. We can take the integral form of that equation so we're adding up all the emissions on the left-hand side and the rate of change in forcing added up on the right-hand side just turns into the, the overall change in forcing over a time interval plus rho times the average forcing times the time interval. And there we are, we've got something which starts to look very similar to the um, expression we had earlier on. If I just remind you what it was, there you are. You can see this is the delta F over alpha plus rho to F delta T over alpha. You can see that the sort of this expression is starting to emerge. Um, and um, we've, I've shown you three uh, uh, versions of this model here, very uh, stylized model um, with uh, rho, this coefficient rho um, corresponding to three rates of decline of forcing after you stop CO2 emissions. So the solid one is 0 0.3 degrees per year, dotted is half of that, and dashed is double that. So, you know, you can see that they all fit over the time scale 
of naught to 150 years or so, they fit reasonably well. 0.3% per year seems to fit pretty well. There's only a small discrepancy here at the beginning. So that's taking us from carbon dioxide emissions to the perturbation in the global energy budget. So now we need to go from the perturbation in the global energy budget or, or radiative forcing to the change in global average surface temperature. So here I'm showing you something probably rather more familiar to you, which is um, in the figure here, a scenario of emissions, a stylized simulation of the response to emissions shown in the top panel in terms of concentrations of carbon dioxide in the next panel, of radiative forcing resulting from that change in concentrations, that's the perturbation to the atmospheric energy budget in the third panel, and finally to global temperature in the fourth panel. And what this um, scenario is, is a scenario in which carbon dioxide concentrations start off at pre-industrial levels, 270, 280 parts per million, and increase at 1% per year for 70 years. This is a very standard uh, stylized scenario of a climate change um, that's widely used for calibrating climate models and that sort of thing, for understanding the properties of the climate system. This results in a straight line increase in radiative forcing, and if you're studying climate change, you'll, I hope, understand why a exponential increase in carbon dioxide concentrations translates into a straight line increase in radiative forcing, but I won't go into that here, but I'm sure your, your, your lecturers will be explaining that in the course of your climate change lectures. And the emissions in the top panel are the amount of carbon dioxide you need to inject into the atmosphere to give this increase in CO2 concentrations. So that's emissions are, you know, start off at 10 um, uh, billion tons of, uh, 10 billion tons of carbon, so um, almost 40 billion tons of CO2 per year uh, to start with, increasing over the course of 70 years. And then it's after 70 years, we do one of two things. We either fix concentrations constant, which is the dotted line here, and that means reducing emissions not to zero, but sort of gradually over time, or we switch emissions off entirely. That's the solid red line here. Now, let's just consider the dotted response here first. What we see in temperature, first of all, we see temperatures rise along with um, the radiative forcing to, to start with. When the radiative forcing is going up, temperatures go up with it. Okay, you can see here, the forcing is going up, temperatures are following it. So that's this term here. The temperature change over any given period is equal to something called the transient climate response, which is the warming at the time of doubled CO2, divided by the forcing due to doubled CO2 times delta F times the forcing change. And that gives you a pretty good prediction of the temperature you get while the forcing is changing rapidly. But then after the forcing stops changing on this dotted scenario here, you can see that the temperatures keep rising. So this isn't enough. This is actually a pretty good approximation to the temperature response to a rapidly changing forcing. But if you want to understand what happens after the forcing stabilizes, you have to include this additional term. This is the equilibrium climate sensitivity here, which is the warming you get on equilibrium when you double carbon dioxide and hold it constant for, forever and let the system come back into equilibrium. This is the transient climate response, which is the temperature you reach when you uh, reach double carbon dioxide, having ramped it up um, by 1% per year for 70 years. And you can see, it, it may not be obvious to you why this equation looks the way it does, but you can sort of see intuitively why it should be. Oh, there's one extra thing here, D2. This is the um, time scale, the long time scale of adjustment of the climate system. And this corresponds to the slow adjustment of the oceans to a surface warming. 
which takes many, many centuries. So D2 is going to be a couple of hundred years at least, possibly longer. So you can sort of see intuitively why this expression looks the way it does. The higher the equilibrium climate sensitivity is compared to the TCR, the more you'll drag up this blue arrow, so the faster it'll warm under constant forcing. And the longer this time scale of adjustment, so if it takes much, much longer to reach equilibrium, then this blue arrow will be initially slower. So you'll get slower warming under constant forcing. So if you just look at this expression here, you'll see that, again, we're saying that the change in temperature is proportional to the change in forcing plus a term that's proportional to the average forcing over that time interval. And what we find, interestingly, is if, and the, this rho t expression here is just, if you just divide this through, it's just the equilibrium climate sensitivity minus the transient climate response divided by the transient climate response multiplied by this time scale of adjustment of the deep oceans. And that turns out to be also about 0.3% per year. Very close, it seems, to the time scale over which we should expect the forcing to adjust if we zero carbon dioxide concentrations. So I put a little exclamation mark there because it's still not clear to me if this is a coincidence. But if we, instead of stabilizing concentrations, we reduce concentrations to zero, then the radiative forcing falls. It doesn't stay constant, it falls by about 0.3% per year. And as a result, instead of temperatures continuing to warm after we zero emissions, they remain constant. And this you know, goes all the way back to 2009, was the finding from Susan Solomon, a paper of ours, a paper of Malta Meinshausen's, another paper of, um, a whole lot of papers um, were published in, in quite quick succession, making this point that in order to stop the warming, we needed to stop putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere altogether. And the reason for this was because of this balance between the long-term adjustment of the ocean here in this term and the decay of the forcing after we zero CO2 that we found in the, the, by relating carbon dioxide to, when we find by relating carbon dioxide emissions to their consequent radiative forcing. Um, so the basic principle has been around for a very long time. And recently we've done quite a bit of sort of tidying up of this relationship and identifying the fact that um, you know, all of the coefficients relating these quantities are actually determined by these very familiar climate system properties, the equilibrium climate sensitivity, the transient climate response, and the absolute global warming potential of carbon dioxide. So if we just take that expression, total carbon dioxide emissions, plus the change in forcing divided by alpha, this number, which is about one, plus rho times the average forcing, this is non-CO2 forcing now times delta T, um, all the, again divided by alpha, we get a prediction of how much warming we should see relative to, and this is just a, a lot of scenarios looking from 2005 to peak temperatures. And you see, we get them all clustered around the, the one one line, which is what we would expect if we got the prediction exactly right. This is not a fit to the data. This is a, a prediction from these underlying properties of the climate system. And you can see it does an extremely good job of capturing almost all of the scenarios. In fact, we, you even can highlight, you see this row of scenarios here, which seem to be off, off the axis. Well, if we go back and look at these scenarios, we discover that that's actually a particular integrated assessment model, a particular economic model of the um, Earth system that is, uh, that's doing something very peculiar um, before 2020. Um, and those, which is why those scenarios are, are off axis. So not only does this actually explain the way the model behaves, but it allows us to identify models that are clearly doing something peculiar. So again, this allows us to identify how different countries are contributing to warming. We can express that in two ways, either the contributions to the current rate of warming, notice there's a log scale here, 
Contributions of the current rate of warming are, you know, China is well out in front of the USA here, but we should also think about contributions to historical warming over time, and then the ordering is rather different uh, with the USA and Europe um, ahead of China. Um, and we can, of course, use this to identify the warming impact of short-lived climate forces like methane, um, which uh, is, you know, and again, this, this, this way of uh, framing the problem in terms of warming equivalent emissions allows us to express the impact of short-lived climate for forces um, in a, um, a very, um, in, in, a, in a way that's consistent with the way we express the impact of carbon dioxide. So we can group together all our emissions in terms of a single quantity, warming equivalent emissions, and we know what it takes then to achieve net zero, we have to get net warming equivalent emissions into the atmosphere to zero. Um, this is what the contributions expressed in terms of warming equivalent emissions to global temperatures um, imply from, from different sources. So you can see the big red band here is carbon dioxide, uh, blue is methane and ozone, which is heavily affected by methane, is in blue, so there's a big wedge here from methane and indirect impacts of methane nitrous oxide in green, and then in orange here, there's the warming impact, or in fact, it's a cooling impact up until now, of, nitri of, of, sulf of sulfate emissions. Um, so these are aerosols generated by various processes, um, which are expected, you know, so this is up until the present, aerosol emissions have been cooling the planet, but we have to clean up our aerosols. And so that cool is, cooling is expected to be removed very rapidly over the next uh, 20, 30 years, uh, which will contribute to a net warming. As a result, if we look at the rate of change of warming in this, so this shows you warming from different sources. This shows you the rate of change of warming expressed in terms of warming equivalent emissions. You can see that those aerosols are going to contribute a lot of emissions. They already are contributing a lot of emissions now because aerosol emissions are declining. Um, and they will, as we uh, head for net zero, uh, we will have to deal with the fact that we will have additional warming due to cleaning up our aerosol emissions. And I know Stephen Schwartz has actually published quite a bit on this problem, this challenge we have over the next 30 years, which I'm sure we'll come back to in the questions. Notice, by the way, over the same period, methane is contributing negative emissions. Now, this may slightly surprise you because you think, well, wait a minute, methane emissions are continuing. They, get, they don't go actually, we don't actually start sucking methane back out of the atmosphere. But methane behaves very differently from carbon dioxide. Methane is a short lived climate pollutant. If we reduce methane emissions, then methane concentrations in the atmosphere immediately start to fall. And global temperatures fall with it. So reducing methane emissions actually has the same impact on global temperature as actively taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, which is the only way you can cool global temperatures with carbon dioxide. So this is not a mistake. This is actually representing methane emissions in a way that reflects their impact on global temperature in a way that's similar to the impact of carbon dioxide. So this is what we mean by warming equivalent emissions, emissions that have the same impact on global temperature. So we know what it'll take to stop global warming. We have to reduce carbon dioxide warming equivalent emissions to zero. Um, but we have a problem. Uh, we currently measure our impact on climate, um, both in climate policy and if you go online and you know type your number of flights you took last year, it probably wasn't very many actually because of COVID, but if you, you know, what you eat and so on into one of these online carbon footprint calculators, what it's actually calculating is not your impact on global warming, but your impact on something called CO2 equivalent emissions, which are the emissions you generate converted to something called CO2 equivalent using, again, a, a conversion factor called the 100 year global warming potential. And that conversion factor has the impact of understating the impact of any new short lived climate forcing emissions like methane from fracking, for example, 
by a factor of between four and five over the first 20 years after those new methane emissions appeared. Um, it also has the impact of overstating the impact of established uh, short-lived climate force emissions. So methane from farming, for example, also by a factor of around four. So I, it's worth stressing these factors. This is not a small, you know, 10% level problem. This is, you know, a serious error in the way in which we represent um, the impact of our activities on global temperatures. And if we're aiming for a global temperature goal, I certainly feel quite strongly it would make more sense for us to account for our activities in terms of their impact on global temperature, not their impact on aggregate CO2 equivalent emissions, which doesn't actually relate to global temperature. I'm not the only one making the point that CO2 equivalent emissions is a badly flawed metric. Um, but what we, what, you know, what we have been pointing out and what's, what is relatively new over the past few years is it's a relatively easy problem to fix. I mentioned that the, the fix is actually here. You can just turn CO2 equivalent emissions measured with 100 year global warming potential into warming equivalent emissions by just multiplying today's CO2 equivalent emissions by one factor and subtracting CO2 equivalent emissions from 20 years ago multiplied by another factor. Notice those two factors are quite similar, but not exactly the same in size, which is why you get those two factors of four coming out in the impact of um, uh, short-lived climate force emissions over the first 20 years and over the longer term. Why does this matter? Well, um, in, uh, in, in lots of parts of the U US, um, you can, in fact, many, uh, both companies and individuals can achieve net zero tomorrow if they want to by offsetting their emissions, by buying, by paying somebody else to reduce their emissions in exchange for you reducing your own emissions. Okay, sounds like a sensible principle as a way of discovering cheap ways of reducing emissions, um, but there's a problem. Because we calculate these offsets using these flawed accounting metrics, um, if we say, for example, if a, an airline was to buy um, avoided methane emissions to compensate for its carbon dioxide emissions, just for example, then, uh, and if they were to do this in the state of New York, for example, where the GWP20 is used as the metric of choice to calculate these offsets, this is the impact on global temperature of that transaction. So if they don't do any offsetting at all, then their carbon dioxide emissions drive up global temperatures following this gray line here. If they do the offset, then it works for about 30 years, but then it doesn't work anymore. Because remember, methane is a short-lived uh, uh, gas. And so the impact of the offsetting kind of wears off and you end up warming. You know, you've delayed the warming, but you still keep on warming indefinitely, just as you would have done before. If you use GWP100, you get some short-term benefit from the offset, but eventually you go back to warming again. And of course, the Paris Agreement doesn't specify warming at a particular date, it just specifies warming. Um, if you use this warming equivalent emissions metric, GWP star, you can actually get a, um, a, a sort of neutral, a climate neutral transaction, which actually um, stops temperatures either rising or falling. Uh, but the, this comes at a price, a price of complexity in what you have to do, because in order to offset a sustained emission of CO2 uh, by avoided methane emissions, it turns out you have to keep um, increasing the amount of methane you avoid over time in order to um, avoid that constant amount of CO2. So it's kind of hard to see how that would work uh, in practice, because eventually you're going to run out of methane to avoid. Um, the other sort of, I think, quite important aspect um, of this problem is that I think everybody, the public in particular, deserve to know what we're trying to do in climate policy. So when the UK announced its net zero goal in uh, 2019, uh, uh, last yeah, couple of years ago, um, the Prime Minister, uh, Theresa May at the time, um, summed it up as ending our contribution to global warming. Now, UK policy defines net zero as aggregate emissions expressed as CO2 equivalent using that old 
flawed metric. So uh, I, I sort of raised this with the civil servants who no doubt had a hand in drafting this, um, this letter. And they said, yes, well, the letter is quite correct because what they mean by global warming is our contribution to net top of atmosphere energy imbalance integrated over the next 100 years. Um, I put it to you that most members of the British public, at least, don't think that's what global warming means. I suspect that would apply in the US as well. So we have a climate policy instrument that defines global warming in a way that's completely different from the way most members of the public would define it, which is the increase in global average temperature. That's, I would have thought, what most people mean by global warming. So there's a, there's a, there's a problem here that, that the, the tools we're using to define our target are not consistent with what most people understand the target to be. Now you can redefine the target to match the tools or you can redefine the tools to match what most people think the target is. But it's sort of, it's a fragile situation as long as they're inconsistent with each other. So now let's get back to the, um, the, the SR 1.5 statement. So um, there's, two, there's two parts to it. And I've mostly focused on the second part so far in this talk. Reaching and sustaining net zero global anthropogenic CO2 emissions and declining net non-CO2 radiative forcing would halt anthropogenic global warming. So we know we need to get net non-CO2 radiative forcing declining um, at about 0.3% per year. Um, that's important to do. Uh, currently, it's going in the wrong direction. It's going up quite rapidly. So we, we need to reverse that. We need to get it onto a decline. But that is clearly achievable. That is not the hard part. And unfortunately for a lot of people, that's what they tend to focus on. They focus on everything else, but not CO2, because people are sort of almost bored with carbon dioxide. But it's carbon dioxide is the important one. And that's the one we have to get to net zero. So how do we get that? Well, the conventional answer, which most people talk about and think about is decarbonization, is reducing the amount of carbon dioxide we generate per um, unit of energy we consume. Um, sounds fine in principle, but in practice, it isn't happening. It's very important to remember this, um, although in theory, it might start happening in future. It's not happening yet, despite decades of effort at climate policy. So this around the world, this graph from the a recent uh, uh, global carbon budget shows the increase in GDP, uh, the, the, the size of the world economy. Um, I'm not including the sort of blip of COVID at the end of this um, because it, it doesn't really change the picture, but you can see the blip due to the global financial crisis here. Um, we have here our energy consumption in uh, green and then the uh, production of fossil carbon dioxide in blue there. So you can see those are really tracking each other very closely. And the amount of carbon dioxide we produce per unit of energy has barely budged. The amount of energy we need per unit of output, per unit of GDP, has gone down. So there's been some progress, but actual progress in reducing the amount of carbon dioxide we generate per unit of energy we use has barely changed. Back in 1990, when this process started, 87% of global primary energy supply was from fossil sources. Today, the, um, the, that figure is 85%. So it's, it's barely changed. And since we're not going to stop using energy entirely, that number has to go to zero if we're going to stop global warming. So that's a pretty formidable challenge. Um, some people try to have tried heroically, I think, to imagine a world of absolute zero emissions. Um, there's a report here that if, if you think we can do this by just stopping using fossil fuels entirely, then the Orbit et al. report uh, from the Cambridge uh, Absolute Zero project shows you what this kind of means. This was just imagining it for the UK, um, but you know it would be a similar story for the United States or any country that attempted to achieve absolute zero by 2050. We have to close all our airports because there's no 
available way of flying, uh, flying planes without burning fossil fuels. We have to reduce all shipping to zero, fossil fuels completely phased out in the 2040s. Um, I, I think this figure, rather more sort of lightheartedly, shows the real challenge in uh, stopping the world using fossil fuels. This is a, a picture of um, a, a village in Greece where they discovered the village was built on lignite, which is a particularly high carbon form of brown coal. And they literally dug out the ground underneath the village, leaving nothing but the church standing, showing you the, the remarkable sacrifices people are prepared to pay to keep using fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are a remarkably valuable resource, and it's very difficult to persuade people to stop using them. So let's consider what actually happens in scenarios which meet the Paris goal of limiting warming to well below two degrees and pursuing efforts to 1.5 degrees. The top panel here, um, panel, this, this shows the emissions in these scenarios. Um, familiar story, they come down to zero. Uh, just, just don't worry about the red lines for a minute. We'll just focus on the blue lines here, which are the, the standard integrated assessment model scenarios um, that achieve the Paris Agreement goals. Dark blue lines here come down to net zero emissions around mid-century. Um, pale blue lines achieve net zero before 2100, but rather later. Um, and those give you either 1.5 degrees or below two, degree, two, two degrees of warming under sort of middle of the road estimates of the climate response. Um, you've probably seen these emission scenarios before. Um, they, they're, they're dramatic in terms of the change, but they're increasingly familiar to us. But what you probably haven't been shown is what's behind them, which is the amount of carbon dioxide that's produced still from burning fossil fuels does not go down nearly as rapidly as emissions go down. In fact, it goes down only by a factor of around you know, two to three by mid-century even in these really ambitious 1.5 degree scenarios. And the reason it doesn't need to go down all the way to zero is because we ramp up rapidly our carbon dioxide sequestration. That's the carbon dioxide we re-inject back into the Earth's crust um, and basically by capturing carbon dioxide either at source or from the back from the atmosphere, compressing it, liquefying it, and re-injecting it back um, underground. Um, th this, this is a vital uh, component of achieving net zero in all of these scenarios assessed by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So the different emissions, of course, are the difference between production and sequestration. Um, so you can see that production, when production equals sequestration, emissions reach zero. Or another way of putting it is to write down the stored fraction, which is sequestration divided by production of carbon dioxide. That's the fraction of carbon dioxide we produce that we re-inject back underground. And you can see in all of these scenarios that starts off at zero because we're not, we're not um, sequestering barely anything at the moment, about 0.1% of the carbon dioxide we generate by burning fossil fuels, and increases smoothly following a sort of roughly quadratic profile up to 100% by the date of net zero. So this is what inspires what we call a carbon take back obligation scenario, where instead of the very complicated combination of incentives and technological responses that go into these um, integrated assessment models that you know, process all of these assumptions about the world economy and so forth and end up with this stored fraction rising roughly quadratically from now to 100% at the date of net zero, we say, well, why don't we just impose that as a regulation and say, if you're going to sell fossil fuels, you've got to get rid of carbon dioxide. You don't have to get rid of 100% of carbon dioxide straight away. You've got to get rid, but you will have to get rid of 100% of the carbon dioxide generated by the fuels you sell by 2050. And inspired by these integrated assessment models, we can choose a profile from here to there. And we've chosen, chosen the simplest one available, which is just a quadratic, where we get roughly 10% by 2030, 
50 percent by 2040, 100 percent by 2050. So following that path would get us to net zero. Why is this, you know, why is this important? Well, right now, if we do what, um, you know, is done in these integrated assessment models and just rely on a carbon price to drive down emissions, we find that people just use conservation measures. They just use these red curves. So this is a, what, what we call a marginal abatement cost curve. It shows the costs of different ways of reducing emissions and comparing costs of reducing emissions by you know, conserving energy, by substituting um, uh, non-fossil uh, sources for fossil sources and so on. That's all those, the red curves. And that's below the blue curve, which is what it costs to, to put, carbon, put carbon away, take it back out of the atmosphere and put it back underground. And you know, almost all the way across this, the red curves below the blue one. So we don't actually get around to doing this sequestration until it's almost too late. And then suddenly we find we've got very, very high costs of abatement that we're faced with in the sort of 2030s, 2040s, if we don't get on with disposing of carbon dioxide. So this is, this, um, is uh, the, the cost of disposing of carbon dioxide going up uh, from you know, around $50 a tonne to start with. It depends on where you get the carbon dioxide from and going up uh, as, we, as we increase the amount of carbon dioxide we dispose of to more like $250 a ton um, when we're actually having to resort to recapturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and burying it back underground. So, but if we put it in terms of a carbon take back obligation, you know, we can take these costs and say, okay, it costs $50 per ton of carbon dioxide to start with to sequester and that rises to $250 by the time we get to net zero, because we're having to resort to capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But if we impose this as an obligation on anyone selling fossil fuels, then of course they don't need to pay the full cost of sequestration because they only need to pay for the cost of the percentage that they actually sequester. And that translates into an equivalent carbon price which is undetectable in the early 2020s. It rises to something comparable to carbon prices in Europe today in the early 2030s and only reaches a high value of sort of $250 a tonne in the 2050s. So this is a much more manageable evolution of the carbon price. Or if you put that in terms of, um, you know, dollars per barrel, um, then, you know, it, early 2030s, you're only adding $5 to the cost of a barrel of oil, which is entirely manageable. So what does, this, what does this mean? And this is where we've come to sort of work we're just doing at the moment, modeling the implications of a carbon take back obligations for the global economy. And the pink, I'll just focus on the pink plume here, which is where you impose the costs of this obligation on producers and you assume they pass that cost on to consumers. What's the equivalent carbon price? And you can see the carbon price rises over time. It starts off very low, it's a log scale here. So the carbon price starts off, you know, only a, a couple of dollars per ton of CO2, but it rises rapidly over time. And by mid-century, it's getting up close to the level of the carbon prices that are required to achieve net zero in conventional integrated assessment models. But crucially, it never gets there. It always stays below the, the levels of the carbon price that are required if you just follow the conventional integrated assessment model scenario. So this is a way of achieving net zero at a lower cost than relying on conventional carbon pricing, which may seem surprising because, you know, carbon pricing is supposed by the economists to be by far the most efficient way of achieving climate goals, but it actually follows quite naturally from the fact that if we rely on carbon pricing, we we don't get around to deploying carbon dioxide disposal in time. So we end up having to spend a huge amount to get rid of, to, to squeeze out the last 20% or so of, of our emissions because we haven't developed the ability to get rid of that carbon dioxide directly um, in, in, uh, uh, as we go along. So um, just to sum up, um, you know, nobody noticed, but back in 2015, the United Kingdom nearly solved the climate change problem. Um, we had a two-line 
amendment was inserted into our energy bill that year um, to say that within one year of this act coming into force, they shall undertake a consultation on measures requiring extractors, importers of petroleum to contribute to the development of carbon capture and storage. And if you work through what would have happened if that amendment had gone through, you realize that this would have essentially transferred the burden of solving climate change from the consumers, from the public, from the government, onto the industry that is selling the product that's causing the problem. And that industry has the capability of solving it. So this is, what I, this is the way I think we need to reframe our, our way of thinking about the climate problem. First of all, as I've stressed, we need to be clear what we're trying to do in achieving net zero. So we need greater clarity in the way we define emissions, the way we relate different emissions to each other, and what we're trying to do in achieving net zero to, to halt global warming. And secondly, because a crucial component of this is stopping global carbon dioxide emissions, we need to make that the responsibility of the industry that is selling the product that's causing the problem in the first place. And I hope on that note, I've generated some questions. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, if you have questions, uh, can you raise, there, there's a raise hand uh, function. So anyone has any questions? Let me start with a, a question since I've already spoken that. So uh, here, what's, you are talking about this, uh, the obligation to uh, capture, to make it uh, that uh, to, to, to sort of first capture a small portion and then ramping up. So what's our technology right now? So do we actually really have this kind of technology uh, to do that? I think obviously in the beginning, you only required a small amount, but uh, you, you, you are envisaging ramping it up to a larger and larger percentage in the 2030s and then 2040s. So so what kind of technological development do we, do we need to achieve that? Okay, so about, um, uh, so in the oil and gas industry, for example, um, about 10% of the emissions associated with oil and gas production and use um, are actually generated by the production process itself, by refining and so on. So this is, these are emissions that um, are, are within the control of the oil and gas companies, um, it would actually be very cheap and easy for them to capture those um, emissions uh, and re-inject that carbon back underground. So they, they've got a capability of doing that. Coal is different, of course, because coal, um, you, you'd, you, you really have to capture the carbon dioxide after you burn the coal um, because it's, uh, it's, it's not a, available. But on the island, coal is also very cheap. So if the coal, um, and, and getting cheaper. So if the coal uh, industry were required to get rid of um, carbon dioxide, they, they, they could easily remain competitive and do so, um, but they would, you know, they, it, would have, it would then make their product more expensive again. But of course that would, that would help make the case for renewables. I mean, so um, by, by if, you, if you add on the cost of dealing with the CO2 problem to fossil fuels, then of course, you know, people have reason, more, all the more reason to use renewables. Um, would we have the technology going forward? Well. Talking to people within the industry, um, they're very confident they can do this. Um, they, but in, in a sense, what, I'm, what we're proposing is almost sort of a giant bluff call. It's like, well, they say they can do this, let's just tell them to do it. Um, and then, you know, if they, if they manage to do it easily, then it won't have much impact on their costs and it won't have very much impact on fossil fuel prices around the world. So, you know, fine, we'll, we can all get on. Um, if they find it very difficult, it'll drive up their costs very rapidly. And that's exactly the signal we need to put into the market to persuade people to stop using fossil fuels. So I would say, does it matter how hard they find it to do this? Because um, whichever, whichever outcome, if you, if you introduce this regulation, whichever, is, whichever outcome you get, you still meet your climate goals. Okay, sure, thank you. So I think we've got several questions to have a raised hand. Uh, the first one is Alison. Uh, please ask your question and mute yourself. Uh, 
Uh, thanks, Miles. That was a really interesting overview. Um, so you noted in your abstract that you're not considering solar geoengineering, uh, but carbon sequestration is a required element to make this happen. So what role uh, does or can solar radiation mitigation play here, or, or should it play a role? I really don't want to talk about solar geoengineering. Um, <laughs> everyone, uh, sorry, it's, it's a bit like saying, don't think of an elephant. What are you thinking of? Um, and, and so if you say, I don't want to talk about solar geoengineering, somebody always asks, what about solar geoengineering? Um, I, I think there, there are lots of reasons why it will be very hard for us to implement solar geoengineering, um, not just the, the practical ones, but, but primarily the sort of governance problems as well, um, which, I, which I think um, mean it, it, it's, uh, it can be discounted as a, uh, as, as a, 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 a serious uh, mitigation option. Um, but I think it's something we do need to be wary of because we certainly would want to frame any regulation on the fossil fuel industry to make sure that a fossil fuel company couldn't claim to be discharging its carbon take-back obligation by quietly venting some aerosol particles into the stratosphere, okay? Because that would that could easily rapidly get ugly. Um, so um, I would I, I would advocate um, being very aware of solar geoengineering, uh, aware of the problems with it, and. Uh, be very careful, being very careful not to slip into solar geoengineering by mistake through poor policy design. And I think there's a serious danger of that. Yeah, yeah, actually, I, I definitely appreciate your perspective on that. So thanks. Okay, thank you. So I think the next question, Cindy. Uh, yeah, I'm, I may have missed this, but I was under the impression that uh, oil had a finite lifetime uh, in, in terms of the amount available, and I didn't see that uh, taken into consideration in the model. Yes, no, I didn't address that, um, but actually, um, so that, that's, that, that's a, that was a whole other topic, but when we, when we first started calculating these global carbon budgets, you know, back 10 years ago, um, you know, how much carbon dioxide can we afford to dump in the atmosphere and still keep temperatures below two degrees and so on, the startling finding immediately was the total amount of fossil fuel reserves underground was almost an order of magnitude bigger than what we could afford to dump in the atmosphere and still keep temperatures below two degrees. So, so yes, we'll, we'll run out of fossil fuels one day, but um, unfortunately, we'll have completely fried the planet before we get there if we just carry on burning them. There's, there's just too much there to, um, for, for running out of fossil fuels to be uh, much of an issue here. Um, we, we will run out of, as it were, atmospheric space to dump the carbon dioxide well before we run out of fossil fuels to dump. I thought the time frame for petroleum was in the order of 50 years. Uh, yes, but the time frame at which if we're gonna meet our climate goals, we need to get emissions to net zero is at the order of 30 years. I mean, if we're going to keep temperatures to 1.5 degrees, we've got to get to net zero by 2050. Um, if we're going to, you know, settle for two degrees, um, then sometime in the second half of this century, yes, you could argue in that case, oil might run out, as it were, run out in time. Uh, but there's plenty of natural gas um, and there's far, far more coal. So one way or the other, we have plenty of fossil fuel resources to push global temperatures well past four degrees and higher. Thank you. Uh, the next question, Brad. Hi, uh, thank you, Dr. Allen. It was a very interesting talk. Um, so I'm not as familiar with um, the this carbon sequestration methods. Like what are those sorts of methods and is there are they sustainable enough that they would be able to be continuously used by the industry to counterbalance future CO2 emissions? Um, so, so first of all, the, the sort of the first 10% um, is, is well-established technology that the industry actually is, is, is already deploying uh, in, in, in just, they're just not deploying it very much because they've got no incentive to do so. Um, so they, they can capture the carbon dioxide where it's generated in a refinery or when the gas comes out of the ground or whatever, um, compress it, liquefy it, 
and pump it back underground. And they actually have been using this for decades, in fact, for enhanced oil recovery. So it's, it's a very well established um, technique. Um, and the Norwegians have been using it for decades now um, simply to store CO2. So they've been monitoring what happens to the CO2 when it's re-injected back underground. And it's, it's very stable. It's, it's denser than the fossil fuels when it's, when it's liquefied and under pressure like that, it's actually denser than the fossil fuels that it comes from. Um, so it, 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 it sits there um, essentially indefinitely. In fact, you know, there's quite a lot of fossil CO2 in the Earth's crust already. So it clearly can stay there for a very long time. Um, of course, there are challenges, um, which is uh, the, the first challenge is the challenge of running out of convenient CO2 sources to capture and eventually having to resort to recapturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And this is where um, you need to be very careful about what technologies you envisage. So we do not envisage recapturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere by the most popular method, which is to grow trees and to cut down those trees, to put them in a power station, burn them, generate energy, capture the CO2 and pump the CO2 underground. This is called bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration. It's very uh, popular, widely used in integrated assessment models, but it has very serious sustainability implications because all of that bioenergy um, production would take up land, water, and nutrients, which might otherwise be required for um, food production, or, or, or worse still, you know, uh, equally bad perhaps, um, uh, would be taking up land that would otherwise be um, available for, for, you know, for natural ecosystems and so on. So we, we exclude large scale use of a bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration in our scenarios because there were so many um, really serious um, uh, sustainability question marks around that. So, so we go straight, as it were, to um, a direct air, engineered direct air capture uh, which is already happening. I mean, carbon engineering is already doing it. Uh, Climate Works is doing it, um, but it's costly. Um, it's it's much more costly than just growing trees. Um, but um, you know, so that's why we get these uh, uh, direct air capture costs in the range of uh, two to three hundred dollars per ton of CO two uh, by the time we actually get to net zero. Okay, thank you. Next one's Jeff. Yeah, you, you almost answered my full question there about the technology. So let, let's just take that one step further. Is that effectively the answer? That, that is the answer to getting where we need to get is legislation that puts the responsibility of that cost on the petroleum and, uh, you know, the fossil fuel companies that are marketing that product. Is that what we need to do in your view? I firmly believe so. I think we, you know, carbon, people, carbon, carbon capture and storage is actually very, it's very unpopular technology. Environmentalists don't like it. And people love to point out that it's made very little progress over the past 30 years. Um, but I think the reason for that is not that it's hard, but because we've got completely the wrong business model for it. Essentially, we've asked the industry um, how much money would you like to dispose of CO2? And the result has been large numbers. Um, so, you know, if you, if you, if you offer the, it's, it's like, you know, the Norwegians decided they would, um, they would uh, build a, a carbon capture and sequestration plant and they called it Norway's moonshot. And of course it cost the same as the moonshot. So if you say you've got to pay what it takes, it becomes expensive. The, the way to find out what this technology actually costs is to make it a, a legal requirement to do it. And then you can bet your life the industry is going to find very cheap and cost effective ways of doing it because that's what they do. Um, and it, it's an industry that's actually very good at complying with regulations. It's actually a very heavily regulated industry already. It, it has a reputation for sort of, you know, Wild West and so on, but actually it's an incredibly regulated industry already. And, you know, if they, if they get a new if they get a new regulation, they, they complain, and then after complaining, they, they implement. I mean, that's, that's, that's what happens, and that's what would, that's what would, would, would I think, um, get, this, get this delivered. Um, I don't think the approaches we're taking at the moment, for example, in, in the UK, the government is basically continuing with the Norwegian mistake of basically saying, we're gonna throw money at carbon capture because 
you were going to throw taxpayers' money at it because you know we want it to happen, and that's the way you make things happen. Um, in the US, you've got your um, 54Q tax incentive to um, encourage companies to do um, uh, carbon capture. Um, the, the problem with that is it's the taxpayer paying a company to do something, basically to clean up after itself. And eventually when the taxpayer realizes that that's what the taxpayer is doing, the taxpayer is gonna complain um, because why should the taxpayer pay to clean up after the industry? Um, they should just get on with it themselves. You made a very compelling case, thank you. Uh, Steve? Yeah, hi, Miles. Uh, hi, Steve. I was hoping you'd ask a question because the first half of the talk was entirely for you. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 uh, I uh, waited until the end of the talk before formulating my comment and question, um, which is actually to say, you, you know, you, you've looked at the whole picture. You've done it very nicely. You, you've given a lot of sort of atmospheric science and, and CO2 science and so forth, all of which is subsumed in your conclusion. But your conclusion almost in some sense could have been reached without any of that. Your conclusion is if you're putting CO2 into the atmosphere, you got to take it out. And we, that's the way to get to, to the net zero. And in many ways, a lot of the uncertainties in climate sensitivity, CO2 lifetime, they don't matter once you reach that conclusion. You've reached that conclusion, it's kind of independent of, of all of those uncertainties that are in the first half of your talk. Uh, so, um, and, and I think it's, it's a very firm conclusion, very sound conclusion, and in some sense, um, economically, socially responsible, uh, those who put it in are responsible for taking it out. Then, then industry will develop an approach to do that and we can move forward. So I commend you on, on the whole thing. Thank you. Yeah. I know that you've reached a similarly simple conclusion in your recent papers on this as well. So <laughs> we're, in, we're in violent agreement on this. Yeah, I think- uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I quite reached the same conclusion yet, but, but uh, you've, you've kind of pushed me there. Yeah, great. So yeah, I, I have a, another question. It's, about sort of the public, yeah, I think it's good to talk like that. Well, if you're responsible for polluting the or to increase in the CO2, then you are you should be responsible for for ca capturing that bad. But I have friends who say that, oh well, uh, it, this definitely will drive up energy costs. So why am I responsible for doing that? It's Hurting maybe mostly underdeveloped nations and things like that. So obviously, if we don't think about the social issue, then it's a challenge sometimes to 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 convince people that we should pay more, uh, because definitely, regardless of what technology they come up, uh, it will be more expensive than not doing it. Well, the, the first thing I, I want to stress is that um, if you, um, it, it, it's very possible to um, spend far more money than you need to on solving a problem like this. If you, you know, start off down a cul-de-sac or, or sort of do things too late or in a panic. Um, so um, I think the problem we have at the moment, um, and I was sort of going a bit quick at that point in the talk, but when I was showing you those abatement cost curves, um, what they're showing is at the moment, there's no real incentive to invest in carbon dioxide disposal, because it's, if all you care about is reducing emissions, it's cheaper, there's, there's other ways of doing it, which are much cheaper than, than re-injecting carbon back underground. So the danger is we, we won't do any carbon dioxide disposal until we completely run out of other options. And then we'll find that reducing emissions becomes incredibly expensive. So we have this very rapid increase in the cost curve. You know, we can halve our emissions at relatively low cost per ton of carbon. But then after, you know, once we've got rid of the sort of wasteful half of our emissions, it becomes really, really expensive to reduce emissions further than that. And that's when we'll be wishing we'd invested in carbon dioxide disposal 20 years ago so that we have a mature technology to deploy mm -hmm. in order to 
you know, compensate for that sort of um, that, that sluggish uh, uh, last 25% or so of emissions that are going to be really, really hard to, to get rid of. But I'm talking about here things like aviation, uh, things like steel production, cement production, for which you know, we just don't have a non-fossil alternative available at the moment. And so you know, the only way of, of, of stopping carbon dioxide um, of right now, the only way of stopping carbon dioxide production uh, associated with steel production would be a stop steel production. And, and that would be a very, very expensive measure that you that would you'd have to, you know, really impose quite a quite a quite a heavy penalty on people to, to do that because you know, steel is a valuable commodity. So so I mean there are technologies out there that but they're still at the sort of lab stage, so to speak, for, for producing steel without generating carbon dioxide. Um, and but by and large, um, generating steel the, the way we do it at the moment, but capturing the carbon dioxide and re-injecting it back underground is, is much the more cost-effective approach. So you, it's gonna, you know, solving climate change is gonna cost. There's no question dumping carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is the cheapest way of disposing of it if you don't consider the implications on the climate. And, but then when you do bring in the implications on the climate, it rapidly becomes clear this is not a good idea to carry on doing it indefinitely. Um, so we kind of know what we have to do and I guess the nice thing about something like a carbon take-back obligation is you can say, right, this is what it costs to solve the climate problem. Now that we've taken care of the climate problem, we can look ahead and realize that, you know, energy costs are about to get much higher for developing countries because they're going to have to pay for all this carbon sequestration. We've enjoyed a century of very low energy costs with a lot of that energy coming from the very developing countries that we're now <laughs> expecting to, I mean, so speaking from a European perspective here, of course, we've, in America, you, 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 you've dug up a lot of your own fossil fuels, so to speak, but you know, Europe has really powered itself on the back of fossil fuels, largely pumped in from developing countries. So it's, um, you know, if we've enjoyed a century of very cheap fossil energy, it's about to get more expensive for other countries of the world as they hit their, their sort of rapid development phases. That's a very good argument for, um, you know, substantial assistance flows, substantial global assistance to rebalance those inequalities. But I would see that that is that's part of the overall picture we need to consider of, you know, how we rebalance these historic inequalities, um, rather than part of our climate policy. Fix the climate problem, and then, and you know, and fix inequality, but don't try and sort of muddle the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. So, any other questions? Uh, Steve, you have still have, okay, I think Kamsima, you have a raised hand. Um, <coughs> yes, um, I, I'm, I'm happy. Thank you very much, Miles, for, for the talk. I, I, I was, when you started, I was thinking of the question of CD, CDM, but towards the end, you kind of answered it. You say, Get that out of the of the ways. It doesn't work. Um, but I, I I was still thinking it, it might still have a little bit of uh, advantage, maybe for some of the developing countries that might not be able to be uh, contribute as much in terms of uh, the, the 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 prices that might have to to, to be incurred. I don't know what you think about. Um, I, I okay, so so I probably shouldn't have said that. If I'm, I, I I didn't I don't think I meant to sort of push CDM out of the way entirely. But I think we need to rethink how we approach the CDM. So you know I think um, I mean you know in an ideal world, and of course we're such a long way away from this scenario that I'm describing here that you know that there's you then have to sort of think about okay what is actually realistic and what would work given given the political realities we're in at the moment. But, but in, for me, in an, it is worth thinking about, you know, what, what would we like to happen? What would be, what would be ideal? Um, and the, the um, you know, I'd have thought the ideal scenario would be carbon take back tells you what dealing with climate change actually costs, tells you what it costs to actually solve the problem. Um, and then we could redirect the principle of CDM to, to, to address the inequalities that, that additional cost reveals. And importantly, I think we could also um, 
uh, it, an important element of carbon take back should be that I think um, carbon dioxide disposal should be an internationally tradable commodity. So it should be because mm -hmm. many developing countries actually have substantial carbon dioxide disposal resources. Um, uh, this is this is controversial. So so you know there's a there's a there's a there's a, a balance here because on the one hand you might say you wouldn't want Europe to be paying developing countries to get rid of Europe's CO2. That's almost like you know shipping your rubbish around the world for other people to dispose of it. You know there's there's some that raises some some big ethical questions. On the other hand, if if getting rid of carbon dioxide is a, a valuable activity, which it will be, um, then particularly many of the countries that have actually made money or built their economies on extracting fossil fuels will actually play a, have a big role to play in getting rid of carbon dioxide because you need exactly the same resources to do it. You know, you need the same geological formations. You need the same you know, kind of kits, you need, so, so it, it for, for, for many countries, um, you know, particularly those that have actually built their economies on fossil fuel production uh, and exports so far, this actually will become an industry for them in the future. So, you know, it, 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 it works in lots of different ways when you think about this. And, and, but I, I, you know, I do take your point that, you know, whatever, if we're going to get there, we're going to have to think about where we are now and think about the injustices of, of where we are now um, and, and map that out on the path. It's, 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 it's not realistic to sort of think of some ideal future and then just say, okay, that's where we need to get to and not worry about the path. You know, we've got, we've got to think it through. And thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, that's definitely a very inspiring and thought provoking talk. Yeah, thanks a lot, Miles. Uh, yeah, it's definitely very, uh, yeah, it, it's gives us challenge to think about. And, and obviously it provides us a simple solution, as you said. <laughs> and as, simple, but not easy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. I, I'll, I'll happily share my uh, PowerPoint with you and I'll just drop it on an email. And so uh, you can- Yeah, can sure. So if anyone wants to- so uh, wants to get the PowerPoint, you can email me and uh, I can share it after Miles share that with me. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot from across the Atlantic. So it's Friday evening for you now. So. It is, yes. So thank you very much. <laughs> thanks again. a lot. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah. Have a nice rest of your day. <laughs> yeah, for now. It's, not, it's great to yeah. see you after all these years. Very nice to see you again. Yes. Okay. Hopefully we'll see each other in person before too long. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye for now. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.